So I keep my freeze dryer at the end of my hallway inside the house. And I do that primarily because I'm running out of room in the garage and it's too either hot or cold in my garage. So the end of the hallway is a good location. But there's an unintended consequence with having it there. And I shared this with uh, some of you in, my, in a video called Location, Location, Location. Because right here used to be where my thermostat was. Well, the problem with my Harvest Right freeze dryer, it produces more than 1,500 watts of heat. And so the hallway was being heated up and manipulating my thermostat. So in the winter time, it was nice and warm in the hallway, and so the thermostat stayed where it was supposed to be. Meanwhile, in the rest of the house, it got down to like 64 degrees instead of 68 degrees where my thermostat was located. So, what did I have to do? I had to relocate the thermostat to another part of the house so that my house now stays more consistent with the temperature in the winter time. If you have watched my videos, you'll know by now that I am not an advocate of putting your hose to your drain line into a bucket. Because what's going to happen sooner or later, your bucket's going to fill up with water and you're going to, you know, shut off the vacuum pump and open the valve and you're going to suck in all this water into your chamber and spoil your food. So, I'm, I've always truly believed that your hose should be above the bucket. So I devised this little clip to keep the holes out of the bucket. My kids just love teasing me on all the many uses I have for hanger wire. So it's a pretty simple straightforward little t clip. The holes goes over this section right there and this section right here goes over the bucket. This keeps the, uh, the holes from going into the bucket and that way you never suck up any water. So this little clip slides over the lip of the bucket and then the hose goes over the end and is terminated right above the surface of the bucket. So it keeps the hose out of the water and it also helps the water drain into the bucket. So it's something pretty simple to do. It's just one of those little things to avoid having an accident. How often do you get this stuff out of your trays and it's just about rock hard and you have all these really sharp ridges and you go to put it in your bag and it just doesn't, it doesn't fit well and there's been a couple of times where I've had something sharp actually pierce the mylar lining. So I might have a little bit of solution to these rock hard items. If you have two bowls, like so, it's kind of like a mortar and pestle. You can put your rock hard stuff in one. Give it a little bit of a turn, and it's all broken up. It might be able to save you puncturing your bag with this little idea. So try it out. You may like it. So these are the two steaks that are left over. This one is sous vide, and this one that has the fancy toothpick in it is the regular steak. So what we're going to do, we're going to, this is the sous vide bag. So you're going to put that one in that one, and this is the regular steak, and that one goes in there. Now, all this stuff you see left in this tray is all the marinade I used on the steaks in the first place, primarily the sous vide steaks. And this is powdered goodness. Uh, whenever I do steaks, I always put the marinade or what other uh, liquids I use, I put those in the tray to, to freeze dry them because when we're constituting the steak, the steak's going to soak up all the water. Well, if you just have water, it's going to soak up water. But if you have flavor, it's going to soak up the flavor. So I'm going to put 
two spoons into each bag and the remaining powder I'm going to put in the Mylar bag with the rest of the steaks. Now steaks will only take what steaks will need. So I have some hot water here, more than enough. I'm going to pour half of that in each bag. And I'm going to burp them, get all as much air out as I can. That's a regular steak. And this is sous vide. Now, these steaks are now wet, so the clock is now ticking. I can leave these out for two hours without worrying about anything, but after two hours, that's when they really need to go back in the fridge. It's been my experience to really bring back a steak, especially a, a thicker steak. It may take longer than two hours. Generally speaking, I'll wait overnight so that I don't get that thin layer of dryness in the middle of the steak. So I've been scouring the internet and contacting manufacturers of oxygen absorbers. And I came up with these three sheets. And I mean, I know there's all sorts of different oxygen absorbers, but when it comes to freeze drying, there's really only about three sizes. So we have the 100 cc, and we have the 300 cc and the 500 cc. And so what I did, I got all the different uh, dimensions and the different manufacturers of oxygen absorbers. Now these are some of the big ones. Not everyone who carries oxygen absorbers was willing to tell me the information I was seeking. And so I pretty much have about six of the big ones. So I have Uline. Now Uline is not a manufacturer, they are a distributor. And they just, uh, and I don't know who the, uh, the manufacturers for Uline. They then have Impact and Sorbet, which is the same company. They often go by uh, different brand names. Mark Pack, I have AGM, which uh, is a distributor for a company called, well, you know, Heosun Sun Non Oxygen Company in China. Uh, Fresh Us, and I want to come, to come back to Fresh Us because I really like that company, and also a company called Multisorb. So for the 300cc oxygen absorbers, these are the physical dimensions, either in inches or in millimeters, of their stated packages. And then over here, I overlaid all the different packages. For example, I have this oxygen absorber right here. I'm pretty sure this was from Harvest Right. So you can take this little packet and you can put it in the square here, and it doesn't quite fit that way, but if I put the square right there, then it lines up perfectly. So this will tell me that this is actually a three, you know, a 300 cc oxygen absorber. Now, this one right here, <sighs> this makes me furiated. This is the one that was from Amazon that claims to be a 500 cc oxygen absorber. So let's go to the 500 cc sheet. Okay, so these are the, the six, no actually here, these are the five most common dimensions for a 500 cc oxygen absorber. Okay, so we're going to lay that there. You can see right immediately that this falls short of all the other 500 cc oxygen absorbers in this class. So this company is trying to say this is 500 cc and I'm saying not so fast because even the smallest absorber which is this green line which is made by impact absorbent it doesn't even come close. So let's take this and go back to the 300 size. Well let's put that up in the corner and this absorber doesn't even come close to the to its current absorbers. This green line right here is impact absorbent and it's even smaller than that. So let's go to the 100 cc. Okay, so if we lay that in here, then it comes, it fits perfect perfectly within, I think this is an orange line or is that my red line? 
this comes in to the perfect dimensions of U line, which is one and a half by two and a quarter. So this size oxygen absorber is more in the physical dimensions of 100 cc's than it is, as the distributor claims, being a 500 cc. So I'm going to post these on uh, on my YouTube channel in the description, and I'll link this with do Google Documents. And I hope if I do it right, you won't need to ask me for uh, permission to download it. It should be able to be downloaded by anyone who has a link. So I'm not saying this is a perfect way of determining what you have, but until manufacturers start uh, putting on the absorbers how many cc's or how many grams of iron is within theirs, it might just be a little bit of a tool to see, see, if, to, to see if this is a 100 cc or a 500 cc. And I can tell you, even from measuring these in the previous video, there's no way in the world this is a 500 cc oxygen absorber. And Amazon needs to take down the ad because I think it is absolutely false and misleading. So anyway, I hope that you might find these helpful to uh, figure out what you might have. And by no, no means do I claim to have every uh, size that's available this is what I was able to glean off the internet and I'm sure there's other oxygen absorbers somewhere that are 100, 300, and 500 cc's that could be a slightly different dimension but this is just a tool to help you do your due diligence. This next tip I got from one of the viewers, his name is Scott S. You got a heavy cotton sock, preferably clean, go ahead and take it, go inside out, fold it over, and no we're not making a sock puppet. Something like that. And place it over your exhaust. It'll help absorb and keep a lot of the fumes coming out of the vacuum pump from drifting around and perhaps getting on your walls. Good job, Scott. A lot of the dollar stores have these little plastic uh, cutting mats and they come in really handy. If you defrost your freeze dryer by using the fan in the entrance to blow uh, air in, you know that that water eventually is going to come out. So, take one of these and I'll show you what to do with it. So I took a small section of that cutting pad and stuck it right here on the base of my freeze dryer, which allows any drips that come off of this lip of the chamber to fall down on here and then go down into my bucket down below. 